Jazz with David Toulis. Hi, David Toulis. Our show is Nuganomics.com. Nuganomics.com. How a man like you, a man with a college education, can ever become a provincialist, a localist. Something which a person with a national perspective would say is retrograde. You're going back. You're going back. You're going downhill. We, with the national economy, we, the national media, and the globalist perspective, the intergalactic perspective even of the internet, we are advancing. We are, uh, we are evolving. And you, <laughs> you little local people down in that little, that little town, Chattanooga, or is it Chattanooga? You people are regressing. You're getting smaller, weaker. And, and why are you getting smaller, weaker? Because you're taking on at least one of you, that is to say you, my listener, you're taking on something of a localist perspective. How can anybody have a localist perspective when we have the world wide web? How can that be? How is it that we are all now from nowhere? We have lost the fromness uh, that used to be part of our uh, American psyche. That's all gone. And, and we, have, uh, we are global citizens. We're much better than US persons. We are global persons. And you in Chattanooga, under the misguided, uh, the misguided hand, the misguided suggestions of David Toulis, <laughs> you are becoming localists and provincialists. Well, I, I confess, my name is David Toulis, and I am guilty. I'm trying to become more provincial in my thinking, more. Yet, in a way, it's it is definitely narrower because, indeed, uh, Chattanooga and Hamilton County do not encompass the world. They are. They are not all packed into this uh, several squ hundred square mile county. On the other hand, you could say, if you, think, if you think about it again with a fresh mind, if you kind of hit refresh, you can think of it differently, that maybe, indeed, uh, we have a suggestion of the entire world on one street. Take any street, the one on which you live, right, at the end of which there is a a stop sign, you take a left turn, there's an intersection with a light, and there's a store, there's a bank, there is a garage. And right there, you, ha and, and right there you have uh, much of, uh, of what civilization brings to, to us, that is to say repair, food, and credit. <laughs> maybe not the credit, maybe the credit is part of our problem. And uh, as, you, as you may recall, I, I did once say something about credit being our essential problem. We have a credit economy, not a capital, not a wealth economy. And I hope we're going to talk about that today. There's a lot, there's a lot happening in the news, but I, in, in the way the, the day has, uh, has shaped up, the things that, I, that, that are kind of uh, on, my, on my mind to talk about are uh, well, there's a, there's a lot about uh, uh, the things that have struck me, touch quite a bit on this, this national surveillance uh, state and how, uh, and how and it occurs to me that w the question is, uh, what do you have to do to be on a federal watch list? Well, you know, there are some, some points. Well, the, the next question is, well, what do you have to do to be on a local economy watch list? Is there a local economy watch list, and what do you have to do to get on it? Now, you might say, well, okay, tell me. Well, in my mind, I would like there, that to be a desideratum, meaning a thing that one desires, a desideratum, something desirable, something longed for, to be on a local economy watch list. There are things great and small that let you get on there. But back on the other side, just for a second, you know, if you're a pro-lifer, you might be on a terrorist watch list. If you are someone who talks a lot about the the Constitution. This, these are potential dangerous people. Uh, someone who talks about decentralization. Uh, someone who talks about the ending of the nation state. Someone who maybe puts stamps upside down on his letters. Now, you know, every letter you mail, the good people uh, through the kind offices of the U.S. Postal Service take a photograph of that. And I bet. I bet there's, it's possible for them to connect upside down federal flags on stamps, you know, the flag stamp that you should probably try to avoid getting, 
But if you're stuck using a flag stamp, and he put it upside down, which is, of course, a distress signal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is part of your watch list uh, nomenclatura, the, the nomenclature that's part of your, your identity, right? That, that, that doubt about the good people, that questioning of the president, the questioning of the Congress, the fact that your, uh, your response in the poll uh, in the Edelman poll uh, was negative, negative, negative. You're not confident in government. All these things, or not all of them, but certainly some of them, make up the fact that uh, you make up the, the the avatar, which is what the good people survey, and which is what they uh, evidence they gather from. It's your avatar, your artificial person, your legal uh, construct, your digital construct, which trails after you. Uh, in all your doings, unless, of course, you are really, uh, really a simple person having the, the virtue of simplicity. Now, I, I have that in some measure, not as probably as great as, as you, but my, my strength is that I'm the slow man of Chattanooga, and that is my name. Our show is uh, Nooganomics, and I am David Tulis. I'm your mild-mannered editor here at our little Copperhead station, the little station that could AM and uh, hoping for FM soon, perhaps. And we are, uh, we are people who ask questions, the questions that no one answers, the questions which uh, are really kind of troubling. And, and we propose, of course, we pr propose answers to these, these uh, questions. Well, how do, you get on a, how do you get on a local economy watch list? I think if I, if I just had to throw out some answers, I would, I would suggest some of the following. Support your local bank. You have your mortgage uh, from a local provider, assuming you're going to have to have a, a debt on your, uh, on, your, on your house. Buying from a local grocer as opposed to a national chain. Uh, getting, your, uh, getting your medications from a local drugstore, uh, such as Hamilton Pharmacy, as opposed to CVS or Walgreens. Maybe Christian or private education. If you are a schooler type, you go to a, a free market school, one not paid for by the uh, in shadowing by lien upon the lands of everybody in the county and, and in the state, but by, uh, by yourself, by you, you pay your own way, or you have a scholarship, uh, a fund established by a wealthy, perhaps a wealthy Christian donor who uh, wants to help the poor or the people who uh, can't afford to have all their children in a in a private school. You get on a local economy watch list by thinking about the local marketplace, thinking about your neighbor, and doing everything you can to encourage people to have the multiplier effect work its way out in local economy. Now, the multiplier effect is that uh, wonderful phenomenon of the locally spent dollar. A locally spent dollar will echo into other people's cash registers and billfolds and purses. It'll show up in other people's checking account balances five or six times. A dollar spent in a national chain, I think, may echo maybe two or three times and then die away into the profit margins of a, of a foreign corporation. Foreign, not referring necessarily to Bangkok or China. Uh, or, uh, or some fine town in, in uh, the foothills of the Alps, but uh, non-local, right? That's, that's what I mean by that. Uh, or another, another uh, way to get on the local economy watch list is to be on uh, John Moss's, uh, from Moss Media, be on, on, his, uh, uh, on his good side and uh, following him along on LinkedIn. He has a, a business page, a kind of a local business news, a kind of networking uh, section for Chattanooga people. There are hundreds of folks on there, uh, many talented, college-educated, bright-looking people uh, on LinkedIn, which is a, a social network for business. And so if you, are, if you have uh, amicable dealings with John Moss or, or men like him in Chattanooga, you are on the watch list for local economy. And well, even now speaking of local business, did you notice that in the Chattanooga Times Free Press today there was not a business section? I'm, I'm concerned about that because I I read business news. I subscribe to the Wall Street Journal, and uh, and I 
have a subscription to the local newspaper because I support local economy, right? You support lo your local paper. And uh, there was not a business section today. The, 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 the newspaper seemed niggardly in its offerings, uh, thin, not, not generous, uh, parsimonious, if you will, not, not, uh, not generous like one wants. And I, I know we all have to kind of forbear this situation with the newspaper industry uh, said to be in decline, though some there are some billionaires who are buying up newspapers, and uh, Warren Buffett among them. So let's see. Did you? Uh, so I'm, I'm just I'm wondering about that, and I and I'm I'm not happy. I'm not happy that I don't get Section C. I care about Section C. I used to be uh, the editor of that section. I was not the business editor. That that high office in the newspaper newsroom uh, belonged to. Uh, John Vass and uh, Dave Flessner and Mike Perry is the deputy business editor and uh, these men are still at the newspaper and uh, I was the one who served them and made them look good. That was my job as the copy editor handling the section that I today missed. There's a story that, that you probably are going to hear about at some point today of a survey of people, the Edelman survey, and it finds that there has uh, there has been a grievous loss of trust in government. And uh, the people who answered this survey in the negative are probably on the other watch list. <laughs> but 44% uh, 44% uh, 44 of people uh, with degrees trust government. Okay, that's a to me, to me that's a phenomenal uh, uh, that's a phenomenal amount of number of people or a quantity of people to say they trust government. But the number who trusted government uh, a mere three years ago in 2011 was 51%. So you have a, a great drop of 13 points. Some countries that saw, according to Edelman, a 20% drop. There's a 21% trust in government among people in Brazil and a 30% 30, 30 or is it 36% uh, I'm not reading my notes very very well here. Not right. Not having a good hand. Thirty six percent, let's say, in India, and the gap is not caused by an increase of confidence and trust given to business per se, but it is a loss on the side of government. This is according to Richard Edelman, who is uh, who is a CEO of this. Uh, this study is called the Edelman Trust Barometer, and it reveals th this story at theblaze.com says the largest ever gap between trust in government and trust in business. Among business people who are trusted are technology, think of John Moss, think of social media, think of Nougat.com and, and uh, media-oriented, digitally-oriented businesses. 70%, uh, automotive 70%, so that's uh, people who make cars like Capital. Toyo for example, Toyota, I would think, is among the uh, upwardly pushing factors in this uh, trust in automotive, Toyota being th the best made vehicle. And buy your car, by the way, if you're looking for a car, buy it from Capital Toyota. Make sure you mention me, extend to me a little grace, if you would, and tell the salesman at Capital Toyota that you are uh, my fan, my listener at Nukonomics.com, and, and uh, my name will be noted somewhere on the paperwork. <laughs> There is a special, by the way, at, at Capital Toyota. The Camry, you can get it for um, uh, $1,500 uh, cash rebate, or uh, if, you, if you take the 0% financing option, you get a $500 rebate. That's pretty good. So uh, Automotive had 70% uh, trust ranking. Banks at 51% were the least trusted. So why is this happening? A couple weeks ago, there was a story similar to this. Uh, uh, Quinnipiac poll, I think it was. Uh, Remark, uh, remarkable drop of confidence in government. And what you have to realize is that this, this bodes evil for valuations. This bodes evil for how things are priced. If government underlies the price of things that you esteem, then those things, as confidence in government retreats in the public mind, those things become less valuable. They may be held up in the marketplace in value for a time just by, I don't know, by some miraculous gap between the trust factor and confidence factor and uh, where people are actually moving. I mean, it takes t take, there's a lag between the time in which people move on something uh, and their, their confidence, and it has, has dropped. So there's that, there's that time. So 
if, if, uh, if we have an economy based on credit, which seems to be the majority report, we do have an economy uh, that's not based on capital, but on the promise of capital, right? the promise to repay later. If your economy is based on those things, what do you have is an economy that's, uh, that's a, confidential, a, kind of a confidence game or scheme. And if you are well invested in areas of it that are uh, buoyed, if you will, by, by this uh, by paper money, let's just say, then you are facing a fall. Don't forget what a bank run is. Uh, if you want to read a story about the, the latest bank run in Chattanooga was many years ago, under 20 years ago, I believe, I don't have it in front of me, but I wrote about it at Nuganomics.com. What, what, what did a bank run look like? It was a, a, a very slight little thing, but a couple of armored cars full of Federal Reserve notes, neatly wrapped in binders, uh, was hauled up in a rush from the Fed branch in Atlanta. <laughs> and the bank was in Dalton, and uh, the, the, man, the man who uh, was the president of that, of that bank uh, claimed that there was a, a personal animus against him by another banker, though nothing ever came of the investigation. The lawsuit, I think, that was contemplated against this other official did not materialize. But a bank run, uh, bank run is when you are uh, facing the glass door of your lender, and there's a note in very small type, all capital letters, on yellow paper, and uh, you have to put your nose right up to it to read it. It's from the FDIC, right? FDIC. Uh, you know, F Dick is like saying LGBT is lug butt. I mean, these are just shorthands for me that I use. To, uh, L LGBT is lug butt for short. F Dick is FDIC. Uh, make a word out of the alphabet, right? You've got you've given this alphabet soup. Make a word out of it if you can. <laughs> you know, OSHA is how you say O S H A. No one says O S H A. You, you make a word out of it. So um, you, there you are, and you can't get your money out because. Uh, because it, there's no, there, there, there is no reserve. Well, the whole system is like that. And the people who get their money are not the ones at the door. They are the ones who bail out electronically. They're already gone. By the time you're at the door and your chain, your, your regional bank or your national bank is having its gigantic hiccup, uh, the big people have already left in the small depositor, you know, the guy who has under $200,000, He's waiting for his money, and he's actually physically waiting in a very local economy kind of way. He's waiting at his local branch to have his local economy cash rectangle uh, delivered, counted out to him uh, in you know one by one in hundred dollar bills probably from the teller. If he can just get through that glass door, and as he reaches up for it and pulls it a little bit, it, it clanks, meaning <laughs> it's locked. Well, that's 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 the idea of a bank run. Bank runs happen when confidence evaporates, and we have. Uh, confidence in government continuing to evaporate. Now, I hope that you will not be glum about this or that you will be unhappy. We have to realize that th these things are inevitable. They have to happen. There have to be very painful interludes where billions of billion, trillions of dollars are, are lost. It will be in the multi-trillions. And even the big people, the, the people who own the national economy, they're going to be hit too. They, they think they're trying to control things. They're trying to keep things tamped down. But they will only be able to go so far. And you, you're going to have these things. It could be a mass inflation. It could be uh, the seizing up of credit, which is what happened in the Great Depression, and w which is what happened in 2008, and, and other recessions where there was a shortage of cash and confidence uh, diminished. We have, we have uh, more, more of these things ahead. And they, they're, they're all on the same template. The, nothing is really new. And so the question is, what are the main ideas behind them? And my, my show, I'm not here to warn you about any particular economic thing. Right? I'm not giving you, like Jim Place does at Let's Talk Money on another station. I, I, you know the show. I'm not here giving you advice about what to do and how to divide your portfolio. But I, I do recommend that uh, since you are a man of capital, you my listener here at uh, Copperhead 1240, that you think in terms of diversification. That's, that's, a, that's a mantra that's often heard, but most people think that diversification is always in national economy. Your diversification needs to be between bonds, munis, stocks, uh, the, the tech sector, the foreign, the foreign stock <laughs> sector, uh, mutual funds, 
Uh, you might want to have some CD. You might want to have 5% in gold. Right? <laughs> That's diversification. Well, diversification in that in national economy is not diversification. It's not diversification. It just that's not it. Diversification is when you have some national and some local, and then the third element I, I would suggest is some savings. Okay, savings are, are are is money not at work. Okay, it's not working for you. If you're if you're uh, well, think for a second. There's a group of people called gold bugs. Okay, they they are they believe and they understand the money issue. They're waiting for the collapse. And they, we, you know, they've been waiting for years. I'm, I'm, I'm a gold bug in a way. We've been waiting for the system to finally face reality. Well, if if you are one, a gold bug and you've bought a lot of gold and silver, well, what's it doing for you? Well, it's doing nothing. It's just waiting. It's not working. So you have to have some. You have to have your money working for you. If you have a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars in money, some should be held in reserve. You know, I would recommend silver. Uh, some should be working for you in a local economy. That could be investing in yourself. That could be investing in a local business. That could be giving a leg up to a son who's back from university and needs $20,000 to get uh, his things together for a little office in which he pr plans to provide a fine service to, to Chattanoogans. And then some perhaps should be in local economy. But the proportions I would recommend would be this diminishing percentages in national growing percentages in local and and savings you need to have savings and, and that that i know i know this is you're you're talk, you're, you're thinking man david's not talking to me here i i know that I, and i know you're you have you have problems but we have to think in terms of liquidity because liquidity is the most important when the economic prospect is the bleakest okay that's when you have to be liquid because when you're liquid you can buy everything at discount when when the crisis hits and prices fall down, if you have cash, you suddenly become king. You can buy everything at 10%, uh, right? Things are collapsing in their value. No one wants to buy them. No one has any money. And you say, okay, I'll, I'll buy that shopping center, not for $2 million that, that, uh, for which it was listed before the crisis. I can buy it for 100000 And you've got that, right? You can pay that. So the idea of, uh, of, of liquidity means you think Evil is ahead. You are a man who's heeding a warning, and you are going to be more mobile. You're going to have savings. You're going to have local economy investing in yourself and in others, and a lesser amount in in the national sector. There's a story on on data theft. Another one. Uh, this one in CNNMoney.com. Or no, it's Money.CNN.com. Massive data theft hits 40% of South Koreans. There's a photograph of three executives uh, with nice heads of hair bowing, as, as Orientals do, in shame and humiliation for uh, a breach caused by a worker at Korea Credit Bureau, which is a company, <laughs> get this, that offers risk management and fraud detection services. 20 million, 20 million. South Koreans, 40% of the country's population, have had their IDs stolen. Well, this is David Tillis, our slogan, Nuganomics.com. Love your neighbor, buy local. How does that work? Why does it work? Is there a reason that we should think in terms of loving our neighbor and buying local? Or is it just a, a, a crock? Is it just a crock? Sometimes I wonder. This is David Tillis. Hang on.
my clients find the right opportunity. I help them find the best way to finance the business, including paying the results for the startup phase. If you're just curious to understand the types of businesses that may be right for you, please call me for a free assessment. My phone number is 423-875-5621. Associates in Foot and Ankle Care gives every patient that walks through their door, whether it be with heel pain, a sprain, onions, or diabetic complications, the very best medical treatment in a friendly, caring environment. From the tower to the centenarian, Dr. Dennis Bazako is able to treat whatever issues affect your foot health. Call 855-0728 for an appointment. That's 855-0728. Dr. Bazako and his staff at Associates in Foot and Ankle Care in East Ridge would also like to take this time to wish their patients and their families a happy holiday season. Call 855-0728. That's 855-0728 for Associates in Foot and Ankle Care in East Ridge. Okay, you get your taxes done by a franchise, but you're just a number. Your preparer might have had a nine-week course, but he's a number two. Are you creating prosperity for your customers and yourself? E.J. Pelton clears the thick underbrush of taxes, helps make your way straight. Don't let uncertainty get in your local economy spirit. Look, come home. Let E.J. Pelton Tax Service handle your taxes. Eric Pelton is the Chattanooga and Sunny Daisy Tax Specialist with 37 years under his belt. Eric Pelton also does bookkeeping and accounting to help you reach your entrepreneurial and financial goals. Confidential advice, consulting, and other services. Yours for the asking. EJPelton.com. That's EJPelton.com. Call 332-3339. That's 332-3339. Think ahead. This is Big News. Wesley's Corner Store on Dallas Hollow Road in Soddy Daisy is now accepting Vilo cards. That's right. At Wesley's Corner Store in Soddy Daisy, Dallas Hollow Road, you can now use your Vilo card on all of your gas purchases. Save big right now. At Wesley's Corner Store, Dallas Hollow Road in Soddy Daisy, accepting Vilo cards. And through this month, save big on tobacco products. Grizzlies, any flavor roll, $9.99. Copenhagen, starting at $9.99. At Wesley's Corner uh, Store in Soddy Daisy. I go. Always find what we need from lottery oh, tickets to the lowest prices on fuel, featuring non-ethanol gas. Wesley's Corner Store in Dave Sunny Daisy. Dave. Now, every evening, you can enjoy fresh baked pizza at Wesley's Corner Store. Cheese pizza, just $7.99. Meat pizza or pepperoni, just $8.99. Two for $7.99. Mm-mm. Delicious fresh baked pizza every evening now at Wesley's Corner Store. Dallas Hollow Road in Sunny Daisy. The American Outdoorsman. Bye. America's premier hunting and fishing radio show. Explore the finest fishing and hunting adventures with the industry's leading outdoorsmen. Great tips and techniques that will enhance your experience in the great outdoors. So enjoy today. The Man Radio Station. The Prime Fishing NASCAR. Tennessee Talk. Southern Rock. Okay, so call for the Copperhead. Get the latest news and information now on your Twitter account. Search Hot News Radio. That's this Hot is News Radio. For the latest news and information, go to Hot News Radio. That's Twitter.com. Then search Hot News Radio. Hot News Radio is a service of Copperhead 1240. Live from Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's Hi, David Tullis. I am a man with a Swiss background and very interested to read this morning Chloe Morrison writing at New.com about a Swiss network. Here in Chattanooga, there's going to be a hub for under 30 talent. The headline is Mobile Society Sandbox Taking Applications from Locals. And it is a, it, the way the story was written made me wonder about something. Uh, Chloe begins by saying, leaders of the Mobile Society of Leaders and Innovators who are under the age of 30 called Sandbox, etc." Well, leaders and leaders, I, and I, I read that and I thought, well, how, how do you become a leader? Or how do you become that? The story says that Sandbox was started in 2008 in Zurich, and uh, it, it goes on to say that uh, now it's become a national network of talented entrepreneurs, inventors, artists, academics, designers, adventurers, politicians, social innovators, storytellers, and business leaders 
with a mission of accelerating those young leaders from the point of local impact to that of global influence, according to a news release. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I've always wondered about leadership programs and leadership schools and you know, the governor's school here in Tennessee where the brightest of, of young people are given kind of exclusive treatment. They're, they're made to feel that they're important, that they're very talented, very wise, and that they are destined because of their intelligence and the, the easy way in which that intel intelligence shows itself to others, right? Their teachers, their mentors, that they are, they are leaders and should aspire to be leaders. And I have a, I, I, must, I must say, I have a problem with that. And the reason I have a, uh, the reason I, I, I would say I might disagree with, with, with the idea is, is the following. It seems to me that we should not be trying to be leaders, we should try to be servants. We should not have, uh, I shouldn't be teaching my, my 11 year old, to whom I gave um, uh, some homeschool lessons this morning, not to be a leader, but to be, uh, to be a servant. Remember in, the, in correspondence back in the 19th century, people would always sign uh, your faithful servant so-and-so. That was because the, the idea was that even if you were a general, and you were writing to someone else, you were writing to the president or you were writing to a, a colonel, you would end your, your missive to him with your, your faithful servant. Uh, even though there's a difference in the rank and clearly you're the general officer and he's just a, he's just a, a, a mid-level officer. Uh, and, and so the idea, the idea that I have is, are we being misled? Are somehow, are somehow in our culture, are we being led to think that leadership is more important than service? And I think, I think that if we want to have local economy, it might be better to turn this backwards. To get on a local economy watch list, it might be maybe wiser to think of how can we serve other people? How can we make ourselves more useful? How can we stoop, uh, if you will, before uh, others who are standing or sitting? How can we stoop before them and wash their feet? How can we, as at the tobacconist shop downtown, how can we be like the man who um, polishes your shoes to perfection. Well, you sit there, you put your foot on his stand, and he is kneeling before you with his towel and his brushes and his globs of, of paste, and he is going to make your shoes shine. Well, that, that's a, that picture at the tobacconist shop downtown in Chattanooga is a picture of the marketplace. That is local economy. And you're not thinking of, ser of, of being a leader. <laughs> that's the last thing that you should be thinking of. You should be thinking of service. And I think even the Lord himself warns against leadership. He warns against, uh, against lording it over other peoples. And he says, and he's talking to the disciples, I think it's at the, la at the time of the Last Supper. In fact, it is. It's the, the preface of his washing uh, Peter's and the other disciples' feet. Uh, and that is, you, you don't lord it over others as, as the heathen do, right? That's what heathen do. They're always... Uh, lording it over, giving directives, and expecting to be thanked, right? They're expecting to be thanked for their involvement, for their intervention. Don't be like that. You are to think about whom you can help, whom you can assist. Uh, can you be valuable to someone in your, in your station? Of course, we all have stations. We all have... That does, I'm, not, I'm not talking about stations and like radio stations. I'm talking about position. We all have a position in society where we are more likely to succeed if we think of serving the other person. And that, that could be in business, and that could be, of course, in charity. Uh, that, that, think of how that, that idea works better in life. If you go in, in, with your, at home with your, with your wife, think if you are a leader type person, right? And you go home. You, my man listener here at NewGenomic.com at Copperhead 1240, the NASCAR station. You're going to go home and you're going to be a le provide leadership. Well, there is a certain leadership that is required, of course, you being the head of the home as the man. But on the other hand, uh, if you take the, this sort of secular, gen generic leadership that seems to be suggested in Chloe Morrison's story and you apply that at home, well, you're not, you're not perhaps doing the dishes, right? You're not perhaps doing things that are really s about service to your wife, making her life easier, showing her that you love her, uh, dying to yourself, mortifying your flesh. That's what service is. Service is 
uh, not about chiefs and playing chiefs and having a high view of themselves. It's really about what can I do to make someone else succeed? And I, I've learned a lot about that in, in the radio business. I'm a former newspaper editor, having worked uh, almost 25 years here in Chattanooga at the newspaper. And uh, I've, I've gone into the radio field by, by God's providence. And uh, the owner of our station is very much like that. He's a remarkable example of wanting people to succeed. For example, advertisers. I am just, by the way, our account executive. If you want to, uh, if you want to advertise to other to someone else who, who's maybe listening to our show, uh, you're, you're my, my our, our conversation, and you think that your your business would be well served by by uh, advertising here at Copperhead 1240. Well, you call me. But what you'll find is that the owner of our station really is bending over backwards to help me succeed. He's all about helping David Toulis to succeed, whatever David needs. And he's thinking about you, the, cut, the, the listener. And that's why we're, we're hoping to have uh, more talk format this year. And also the advertiser. It's all about the advertiser and how those three parties work together to make each other succeed. It's a very, it's a very uh, wonderful thought, but it's not, the idea of leadership, I think, comes more into play when you have a, a kind of more of a statist orientation. Because there, of course, the state is the leader, right? The state is the lead capitalist. The state is the lead investor. The state has things that in the newspaper are called initiatives, right? <laughs> the state is always moving and moving things around and shuffling people and, and, and uh, you know, playing shell games that, that we think are really entertaining. And it's all about leadership. But the marketplace is really not that. And, I, and I'm not suggesting that this uh, Swiss-based network out of Zurich is, is, it falls into that error. But the way the story is written, it just evoked this line of thinking in my mind as a, as a, possible, as a possible danger. Yeah, there were several other things I wanted to get to in, in this direction of leadership. Uh, na national economy is all about leadership. It's not, it, it doesn't bring people to serve others. It, it doesn't bring people to be humble. Uh, it, rather, I think the way national economy and national government have, have slowly shaped the American mind, uh, maybe not yours as much as other people's, but certainly we've all been affected by it, is in, uh, in the direction of, of, uh, of public education and and how, how people are turned into material. It is, a, it is a form of materialism. And public school has, of course, internal to its doctrines. It has the, the basic doctrine of, of, of uh, materialism. And from that are others such as evolutionism and statism and centralization and consumerism. These all rise from the, uh, the agenda of public schools. But there's a, a remarkable story that I, I came across at uh, WorldNet Daily. That's WND.com that talks about that talks about this uh, this entering how, how the machine enters the souls of people and exposes their souls now you, you think you know what I'm talking about and, and you're right we have we have national surveillance that is that is a total a total surveillance we are not a free people uh, with this if it continues we are not a free people we do not have privacy uh, the great avenue of liberation, which is the internet, is being barred to us because nothing that we do there is between you and me, right? There's nothing we, you and I can communicate, whether by text message, SMS, or by email, or by a telephone conversation, that's not, uh, that is not spied upon by the good people whom we have to hope are in a building <laughs> that will have its lights turned off because of the bill not being paid to the local utility and the water bill, <laughs> the water bill <laughs> not being paid to the, uh, the little Utah county government that has charge of the utility out there that is, uh, is going to be holding hostage, we hope, the, the uh, delightful NSA facility that is going to be the storehouse, the treasure trove of all your text messages and all the PDFs that you send back and forth to your co-workers and all the all the private conversations, the shopping lists, the, uh, the emails where you express your regret for having offended someone, all those things are part of the public record. It takes place in education. When I say education, I don't mean education, I mean the public school system, 
where there is a, uh, in the common core, there is a digitization of, of human life and, and objectifying of people. People are not allowed to be flesh and blood. They're not allowed to be private. They're not allowed to be unstudied. There is a desire to have a total handle on them. And it's funny, in, in, my, in the things that, that caught my notice today, I, there's, a, yeah, there's a story that, that on our Warren and Daily, but before I get to that, there's a, another one in The Guardian, the English newspaper, about, about a child tracking wristband. Uh, headline says, edges us closer to a dystopian future. This is a, a gadget that's uh, developed by Cisco Systems at Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas this week. And it is a, a total system. Your child wears this, and nothing happens without you're getting an email, you get a vibration of this, and uh, it, it, he's doing something that's slightly off the child wearing this, this gadget, slightly off the routine, you get a notice about it. <laughs> uh, when he turns on the TV, goes to the refrigerator, you're constantly being told where he is, and uh, it, it turns on the television form, and it, it proposes a program, <laughs> and watch. And uh, in the story, the two, the two children are called Aiden and Foster, very modern names. You're protecting this child from predators and pornography. You're nudging him away from harmful food and obesity. The story says the benefits are obvious. But what sort of childhood, this, this writer asks at Guardian, uh, that where every move is tracked, scrutinized, logged, or judged, where you cannot wander, try something new, be spontaneous, be yourself without issuing a beeping alert from wearable connected technology. This is helicopter parenting and it's most stultifying, a constant hovering presence. Uh, Cisco and hundreds of other companies at CES are pitching their products. Tiny cameras, wearable sensors, connectivity services, mainly to the U.S. in countries where crime is uh, continuing to drop. He calls it cloying surveillance. And cloying is when it's ingratiating, it's constantly there, it's constantly trying to meet your approval. Everything, everything you do is of, of importance. Every, every word you drop is very important, extremely interesting. That's cloying, you know, that's, that's uh, sucking up, you might say, sucking up. And this might, might be fine for, you know, for in some situations, but uh, the story points out that, that uh, from a, a, a quote from a man named Stuart Sykes, who runs a consulting company called Park Associates, that old people are resisting this, but younger people, he says, tend to love this technology. It's polarized the market. Well, you're probably, my listener, probably would fit into the older category. You're wiser. You're not as uh, well lubricated uh, in the, the seamless entrance into this, uh, this cloud where uh, all your movements are tracked. And, and, and the data kept, not just for a few minutes, but it's kept forever. There is a, there's a dossier. I'm sure there are thousands of dossiers that have your name on it. But with, with some effort, not, probably not a lot of heavy lifting, someone, some company, someone who really wants to sell you a, something, someone who wants to find a, uh, a gap in your defenses because they want you to sign a contract, right? They're going to they're gonna put on a data miner on your case in that rival company. And they're going to find out everything they can. They're going to buy whole data sets that, that are about you. And they're going to try to uh, pair away the, uh, the, the anonymity and find you. And, and then they're going to uh, make you a proposition that you can't refuse. This story points out that, that uh, Edward Snowden's revelations are, you know, are about state surveillance are, are well, well heralded earlier by Ray Bradbury and uh, George, George Orwell in 1984. And he says, but the greatest danger to privacy or privacy, as they say in England, is not the government but ourselves. Google, Facebook, and Twitter have built empires on the fact we prefer convenience to privacy. And, uh, and, and he, he makes reference to a novel I've not read, but I've, I've heard mention of and citations to. It's called The Circle, David Eggers. And the, the protagonist is a woman named May Holland, and, and, uh, and, and she says she embraces a company's mantras where she, where she works, that, that secrets are lies, sharing is caring, privacy is theft. And there's kind of an inversion of what makes up civilization. Civilization is built on on privacy. It's built on personal relationships.
And, and I, I mentioned that to get to the, the whole idea of the school doing this. Now, now, schools are, like banks, part of the surveillance apparatus. They are they're there to make, uh, to make your children a certain kind of person. And this person is one, you're, you're a little bit like what you're supposed to be. You, they didn't quite get you, but th the newer generations are more amenable to having the sharp edges, the quirkiness, the oddities, the unpredictable, hilarious, weird, uh, wild things that are really part of your makeup. They're not things that you have to, you, my listener, have to, to, to stoke up, right? They're there, and they're, they ma they're part of what make you successful in your area. Now, you could be more successful in more areas if you just let that go, but these other, th these other aspects of your character, you, my listeners, have been tamped down by custom and routine and, and some of the drudgery of you know, modern life. And, and here you are, you're a middle-aged man and, and, and you, you, you've kind of grown accustomed to certain things not moving. But there still is that part of you. And that's, that's the part of you that I, that I want to mention. And I'm, I'm hoping for a couple things that you'll use that to develop your own little business. Like uh, the people who began Jazz Pizza here, here in Chattanooga, great pizza. You'll use those, uh, use those things to start your own little business to, to secure ourselves against the, the coming disasters, right? And the other part is that you use those things to, to encourage your family member. That, that part of you, see in your children's lives how they, they've lost already what you, you've, al you've almost lost. They've lost it largely. Is there any way to recover? Is there any way we can counteract the dehumanizing uh, socialization of the public sector, where every every person is almost always a public person, where and, and you know, that's the, the English, I think, understand the, the 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 dangers of that. Not modern England, but England in the last couple of centuries, where many of the odd people uh, were the geniuses, the great writers, the great poets, the great literary figures. They were they were not public people. They were very private people, and their works are with us uh, forever. You know, Charles Dickens. Some very famous public, you know, public men, journalists, and whatnot. But many of them were uh, geniuses and peculiar, odd people. The story about Common Core is in WND.com by let's see who's the author. Uh, I can't see the author's name, but it talks about how how personalities are turned from private people to public people, and the concern that it expresses again, is in favor of local economy, in favor of personal relationships. But in that sector, which is all public, uh, in which there is no hope for local economy at all, uh, the, the, the book, the story points out that there is a uh, kind of transfer to federal jurisdiction, which the feds can't have data on students, so it's being offloaded to private party. There's a, a fellow from the American Principles Project Jane Robbins, who's quoted in the story, she says, parents will not be notified if personal information about their children is released, nor will they be told who gets it. Common Core, according to Dr. Karen Ephraim, who is the president of a watchdog group, Education Liberty Watch, uh, says that uh, this, uh, this uh, data system creates a room to tomb dossier on kids and families. That includes between 300 and 400 data points such as parents' voting status, religious affiliation, medical data, newborn screening, and genetic data. The personal information is to be stored and shared among states in what amounts to a national database clearinghouse of information that Dr. Ephraim says will follow children and may help determine where they work or go to school. So notice how the database is not, it will be used to guide people. And you think that's a good thing. Well, maybe for some, for uh, those who are uh, less than you and less in, in quality of person than, than you, my listener, and your family, that may be inevitable, may be even desirable, so that, uh, you know, so that we can avoid a revolution. It's lifelong, Ephraim said, and here's a quote, and it's not just phone records or tax records or that kind of thing. It's literally their entire lives and everything about them and their family. We have, uh, we have coming upon us a burden of label, a label burden, a data mining burden that it's very possible in the future your children will be led to believe that it cannot be escaped and therefore is a predictor. It is a predictor of certain failures, certain strengths, certain things that have to be uh, the focus of, 
state assistance so that important revisions can be made in your children's attitudes, values, beliefs. They're, they're non-cognitive <laughs> disposition, to, to quote this story. Their social skills. Maybe their social skills aren't, uh, aren't what they should be. Uh, their behavior, as evidenced by these 400 data points. You see what's happening? There's control. There's, there's a kind of sovereignty. There's a kind of predestination which is accruing into the hands of other people. Now, I believe, uh, unlike you, I believe that predestination exists with God. Now, you're not a Christian. I know you don't believe that. But, but if there is a God, he has to be totally sovereign and totally in control. That means to say he has the power and the right of predestinating everything, of making everything come to pass according to his plan. But what's happened with, uh, with the NSA, with Common Core, is that the idea of predestination is growing, and it's being slowly drawn away from you, the dad, <laughs> who want to help your children along, right? You want, to, you want to kind of give them a sort of predestinatory nudge. You want to you resource their interests, right? These are all kinds of predestination that comes from you, your, their, their father. And you want to uh, you want to get them into going in a certain direction, all right? Faithful men, you know, when you pray for your youngest child at night, what do you say for him? What do you say? Well, you know, I say for my my young one, whom I still pray with before going to bed, I, I pray that God would make him a a faithful Christian, a true southerner, a gentleman, a man who dies for himself, a family man. And a fighter. Those are the things I pray for for my son, and and uh, I, I thank the Lord that He forgives us for our sins, and I, I I thank the Lord that that boy's eyelids are heavy, and that his arms are heavy, and his legs are heavy, and I kind of go through all all his extensions, you know, down to the toes sometimes. They're all heavy, and he's ready for sleep. But of course, he does. You know what he does? After I after I give him a good night kiss, he leaves the light on. <laughs> he, he's gone through all my comic books, and now he's re read Bill Malden's. Uh, uh, war cartoon book, and uh, <laughs> uh, well, that predestination that comes from you, okay, uh, in, insofar as it's a human thing. Hang on, we'll be right back. Save two thousand dollars now. That's right, you can save two thousand dollars right now on a 2014 Lexus RX 350. This is unheard of. $2,000 cash rebate on a model 2014 Lexus RX 350. But you have to get the Capital Toyota on Lee Highway. You can save $2,000 right now on a 2014 Lexus RX 350. Capital Toyota is one of the world's classiest mid price car. The Camry. Capital is your Lexus and Scion deal. And this month you'll save $2,000 now. That's right. You can save $2,000 right now on a 2014 Lexus RX 350. This is unheard of. A $2,000 cash rebate on a model 2014 Lexus RX 350. Capital Toyota on Lee Highway with a savings of that much better. If you ever thought about starting your own business, trying to figure out which one may be right for you is a very daunting task. My name is Bruce Kripp with the Entrepreneur Source, and I can help you look at franchises or business opportunities that are right fit for you and the economy that you live in and are right for the greater Chattanooga area, both demographically and competitively. If you would just like to learn more about the opportunities that may be right for you, please call me for a free assessment. My phone number is 423-875-5621. 423-875-5621. Picture that pearl of steam rising from your fresh made pizza. How can it flash? Let it take you a oh, while to tease all your senses. I'm talking about Jets Pizza. If you eat out of Jets and Nixon, or take home your steam, Deep dish square pizza, you'll love Jets. They use only the best ingredients in a family recipe. Also try the cheesy bread, wheels, chicken, mmm, or bread with bacon, antipasto or Greek salad. Jets Pizza and buy low nearly S curves. Open till 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday at 11 p.m. Friday and Man, Saturday. You can order I can't get in. Drats. JetsPizza.com. That's JetsPizza.com. Or call them now. We'll have it ready when you get there. 757-1616. That's 757-1616. Hot and delightful. Drop the clouds. Okay, you should do business next. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the time. You're a hard worker. Your little business is your future. EJ Pelton Company is an accounting and tax service that works to help you keep what you have earned. EJ Pelton keeps current on tax laws and has been helping people like you 37 years. EJ Pelton has an office.
service on day like it's Sunday days. Open all year to serve you. Uh, so EJ Call 332 3339. That's 332 3339. That's EJPelton.com. Think it hit. All systems go. Advantage Printing and Mailing Services. Your advantage is in our name. Customer service. Advantage Printing and Mailing Services. Family owned and operated. Advantage Printing and Mailing Services features the highest quality in all your printing and graphic news, including engineering drawings. Offset Printing and Mailing Services. Advantage Printing and Mailing Services, your one-stop shop for color graphics and much, much more. Call 629-1800-423-629-1800 for Advantage Printing and Mailing Services. 4031 Rainer Road in Chattanooga. That's 4031 Rainer Road in Chattanooga. Call 629-1800-423-629-1800 for Advantage Printing and Mailing Services. I can leave this. Hi, this is David Tudor with NewNomics.com. I've got a question for you. Does your heat and air system have mildew and mold, smoke, water, or wind damage? Is there an odor in the air you breathe coming from your air? Dust, formerly known as dust clusters, cleans and remediates the heat and air units and the air vents in your home or business. Highly trained and experienced staff address the indoor air quality at your home or business and make it ah fresh. Our family's been helping build our local economy and it's been used for 16 years. You know us as Dust Busters, Dust, Indoor Air Professionals. Call us at 876-9907-DUCKS, 876-9907, that's 876-9907, call now. Get the latest news and information now on your Twitter account, search Hot News Radio. That's Hot News Radio. For the latest news and information, go to Hot News Radio. That's Twitter.com, then search Hot News Radio. Hot News Radio is a service of Copperhead 1240. The main metal radio station, Honey Fisher, NASCAR, Tennessee Talk, Southern Rock, Kicking Country, WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDG Sunny Daisy, Chattanooga. Live from Chattanooga, Tennessee, it's New Nuganomics with David Toulouse. Hi, David Tulis. Our show is Nuganomics.com. We have the wonderfully plain idea that simple people have without realizing it, that slow people have in the backs of their minds without being aware of it. And that is this. Near is better than far. Personal is better than corporate. And small is better than big. And it's interesting how that, that framework is a, is a kind of idea is a, is a concept that comes out of the the whole argument for local economy that is what our show is about my name is david Toulis. thank you for joining me here for a few minutes this afternoon there's a little bit of uh, snow flurry coming down outside my window maybe yours as well it, but it's still about 40 degrees outside but i think it's getting colder since the early morning hours slightly anyway our show is uh, uh, one, one that I hope will direct you to local resources. We are hoping that, that you, my listener, will start your own little business and that you will take part in local prosperity, that there will be a profit center in your house, in your uh, between, because it's already there between your ears. We just have to bring it out slowly into a particular market, one which you know about, right? You know about that market. We just have to encourage people like you and you to make something of it and you know if you're an employee you're not earning any profit an employee is paid only what he's worth the, the profit accrues to the owner of the, the employer right the employer he takes all the risk he has all the organizational tasks he's got capital invested and that money uh, that money that is profit goes to him. You, as an employee, get nothing of that. You just get what you're worth. So th the question is for prosperity in Chattanooga, pending the crisis, is for every man to have a profit center somewhere in arm's reach, something that he has charge of, uh, for which he's gotten advice. You know, you get advice from uh, Catherine Foster down at the Chamber of Commerce. You can go to 
uh, uh, company lab downtown. There are mentors at uh, Chamber of Commerce meetings you can meet. There are friends who are people who've been in business and will be glad to coach you and help you. They're business coaches. One of the ones I want to mention in that direction is Bruce Krebs. He runs Entrepreneur Source in Chattanooga, which is a, it's a franchise that, that provides the service of getting men like you, or a man like you, into your own business where you have the profit and the service uh, directly to a marketplace or in a marketplace. His name is Bruce Krebs. Entrepreneur Source is 875-5621. 875-5621. Call him and tell him that you're my listener here at Nuganomics.com and would like to chat with him to see what he has to offer. And I, I strongly suggest that you take advantage of his being here and being very open to talking with you, the friend here of Nuganomics.com. Another man who's a resource in this direction is Eric Pelton, who's an accountant, prepares taxes at E.J. Pelton Company. That's ejpelton.com, 622-3156. That's 622-3156. Tell him that you're my listener and that you'd like to pick his brain about what you're doing and what your idea is about. Also wanted to mention Capital Toyota, one of our, uh, one of our sponsors. Let, uh, let the salesman know if you are about to buy a Toyota, the best brand that you're my listener, and uh, that will extend a little grace to me. If you have some printing in your, uh, in your uh, life needed, if you have some printing needs, you know, talk with Alan Jones at uh, Advantage Printing. That's where I'll be sending my homeschool newsletter uh, for mailing when it's done sometime in the next week. Call Alan at 629-1800, 629-1800, Advantage Printing, where the, uh, the advantage to you is in, in, is in his name. Also, Ducks, the clean air uh, professionals, the indoor air professionals, would be a, a great contact if you have uh, wheezing and puffing, puffy eyes in your office. Maybe there is uh, grot and gradu in your ductwork. Uh, call Mark Thompson at 876-9907, 876-9907. Remember, every Friday is Panera Posse at the Panera Bread Store in Hickson. I usually attend that. That's an early morning uh, gig, if you will, where uh, a bunch of homeschool dads, a very small, intimate crowd, get together for bagels and coffee. We round up the bad guys and put the money back in the bank. And that's Panera Posse every Friday morning in Hickson, and you are certainly welcome to come. And we'd love to hear what you have to say. We'd love to hear about you. What are your experiences? Where have you been? And where are you going? That's the question that Pilgrim always asks people he meets in John Bunyan's uh, fabulous uh, morality tale, Pilgrim's Progress, which I, I would recommend that you read, not in the expurgated, toned down version, but in the original. To your, to your children. It's a great family worship book, but it's a great book for uh, young minds to hear of a fabulous adventure of the man who uh, escapes the city of destruction and has many adventures on the way to the celestial city. So uh, remember, think about local economy, think about supporting our, our advertisers. Uh, I want to mention also uh, Hamilton Funeral Home, right near our studio. It is a, a great local funeral home, locally run, locally managed. I had great chats yesterday. This is kind of long chats of, of uh, the two, the two uh, owners, Ralph Mosier and Josh Jennings, longtime experienced men in the funeral care, the death care business, as it's called. And uh, that, that is, so, if you're needing a, re a referral, uh, take it from me that, that that's a good group of men to handle a death in your family. And that's uh, Hamilton funeral home, locally owned and locally managed. One of the things that really interests me is, is how, how we've come so far away from local economy and, and how uh, in, I don't know that we, how we can restore it. I think there has to be probably a kind of a Christian reformation, a reformation within Christianity that will enable some of the things that I propose to come about. They are really spiritual and because, uh, because the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, has not breathed uh, across the land uh, is, is, is 
as greatly as he could, and as probably he will, or maybe as he will. There has been uh, a lot of agony and a lot of decline in the 50 states, and in their people. Now, my website is nuganomics.com. We explore some of the reasons why. It's a, it's a website that is, uh, again, the, the name is nuganomics.com. It's, it's about Christianity, but it's about how there is this important interface between Christian conviction, widely held among the people, and uh, the, the world of economy, the world of prosperity, work, industry, production, factory, import, export, capital, and government. And the, the interest that we have in these, in these questions at nuganomics.com is because we think that despite uh, terrible odds against us, terrible odds against you, uh, there are things that we can be doing, and we can have a positive and cheerful uh, mien. We can have uh, a smile on our faces as we uh, think about the necessary collapses and disasters that are uh, well-deserved in the national sector. And one of the things that we write about at, at nukeonomics.com is how we came to where we are now. And of course, we can't cover all. The, you, you read to find out about things like that. You really need to be a man who reads books. Okay, you read books to find out the deep things. And here at, uh, at Nuganomics.com, our show on the Copperhead Station, we have uh, suggestions that are drawn from reading. And 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 my website has a little bit more than suggestions. There's there's a little bit more meat there. But and you understand why, right? But the written word is far more powerful than, than, in many ways than the spoken word, because in writing you can consume a lot more words per minute than you can simply in listening or in talking with me, right? If you are one to talk <laughs> into your radio system to defy the host, you can certainly do that, but uh, sorry I'm not, I'm not able to hear what you're saying, but anyway, we understand that, that you, my listener, are here for a few minutes today at uh, Copperhead 1240, the local economy station uh, seeking to serve local business and the local man and that's you uh our 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 listener well one of the things i think we need to consider is that national economy has all kinds of high costs that are not often considered um think for example in farming uh farming is is something that we want to we want to encourage we want to encourage local local the local food movement is is i think the the, 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 one of the strongest areas where, where a reformation of morals in the marketplace is taking place. And when I say morals, what I mean is how people live their lives. And, and it, one does not have to be a Christian to partake in this, of course, and I think probably most of the people who are involved in the local food movement are not Christian people, right? They're not like me. They're not professing Christians. And you know, they're like you, right? They have, they have good interests and good ideas, but they're not professing not professing Christians. Well, one of the reasons we have uh, we have a crisis in obesity, we have a crisis in soil depletion, we have a, a tremendous centralization of marketplace. We have a money economy. We don't have a we don't have a an agrarian economy anymore. We have a capital and now a debt capital economy, uh, and and the chickens are are coming home to roost, if you will. And there are several major changes that occurred in the 19th and 20th centuries that affected uh, society and that it is shifting, uh, shifting economic activity from, uh, from uh, and people from, from the country to the city. And in a way, they're all mistakes. They're all kind of mistakes that, that uh, have occurred and they cannot be readily recovered from. One is a shift, according to uh, Franklin Sanders, who writes The Money Changer, newsletter, we have a wealth economy, we went from a wealth economy to a money economy, we went from a household economy to an industrial one, from family farming to industrial farming, those are three, and then finally from local economies, plural, to a national economy. And these are, uh, these are and because we, the, these shifts have all taken place, we have, we have national problems which cannot be solved. They cannot be solved by Congress. They cannot be solved by nonprofit think tanks, by the United Nations, by, by anyone. They are, in, they are insoluble. They, are cannot, they cannot be dissolved. They cannot be made to go away. They cannot be fixed. And so what do we do? How do we, 
uh, how do we get through this crisis? Understanding what's going on around us, right? Things that we cannot affect. We, no matter how many conservative fo Facebook posts you, you put up there today regarding how bad Republicans are, okay? <laughs> Or how evil Obama is; those are th those have no effect. Okay, they're, they're, you're doing no good, and you may be wasting your time. Um, uh, there's a and this I'm, I'm looking at a, a, an essay that, that I've published at, at uh, newgenomics.com from uh, Franklin Sanders. The, he's a he's a Middle Tennessee farmer and a writer. He has a new book out about uh, uh, the mud hole where he lives in, in on the farm. He's a kind of an old world farmer. Has been. In, uh, left Memphis uh, in 1998 or 9 and moved to, a far to farmland in, in Middle Tennessee. And uh, his essay talks about how uh, the American way of, of farming is very industrial, it, it not, it's, it's not organic. And he mentions, he mentions how when in Haiti, there was a, he has a part of this essay talks about the, the ha Haitian pigs. These were pigs were adapted. They were uh, they were garbage collectors, soil fertilizers, and the savings account for you know, tens of thousands of, pe of people. But in 1982, uh, international bureaucracies said that you have to kill all these pigs because they they are carriers of the swine flu. So the Creole pigs were destroyed. The whole population was wiped out, and the Americans promised to replace that pig. And two years later, it sent in a new and better pig from Iowa. Uh, and here's, here's what he says, so much better that they required clean drinking water available to only 20% of Haiti, roofed pens, and imported feed at $90 a year, where per capita income is about $130. The Haitians dubbed them uh, Prince à quatre pieds, which is four-footed princes, that's in French. Quatre pieds means four feet. Worse still, the meat did not taste as good as the Creole pigs. Rural school enrollments dropped 30%. Rural Haitians ate much less protein. The peasant con economy was decapitalized, and soil fertility and productivity were wounded. The peasants were tapped to the tune of six hundred million dollars. This, of course, is efficiency, right? The Americans are famous for efficiency, and he says the introduced pigs might have appeared superior on paper. They were faster growers. They were more efficient meat producers. They had heavier maturity weights and uh, were more efficient feed converters, but in reality, they weren't appropriate to Haiti's conditions. And he says industrial farming is simply not inherently more efficient than family farming. Okay, that's a, that's a novel idea for you. In fact, there, uh, there's nothing more efficient than a family farm. Simple size affects that, if nothing else. A family with only 200 acres will watch those 200 acres much more closely and more intimately than a corporation with 20,000 acres, and it will happen every time. If there are economies of scale, he points out, there are also wastes of scale, and he says that factory farming, of which we are all the beneficiaries, if you will, uh, has discovered all of them. He says, don't forget the human and social costs of factory farming. Driving family farmers off land has reduced the farmer to a rarity and endangered species. Yet in no way can urban life produce the flexible, forward, and responsible character of a farmer. Quite literally, farmers have been throughout Western history the backbone of a nation. And they remain that today. Yet today's farmers are not much more than assembly line workers driving a factory or a combine, an air-conditioned one at that. And he talks about how what a CAFO is. A CAFO is a concentrated animal feeding operation. It's like public school. Public school is to education what the CAFO is to the farm. I'm a homeschooled dad by conviction. I married a woman, Jeanette is her name, and uh, before I married her, I determined that we were going to be a homeschool family. We were going to have a farm, if you will, an educational farm. We were not going to run a CAFO, the concentrated annual animal feeding operation that is the, the hallmark of American agricultural production. Because there you have unnatural food, you have uh, horrible conditions, they are inhumane conditions. Cows, they're not supposed to be eating grain, which is what everyone feeds them. Cows should eat grass. It affects the quality of the meat. Uh, and it is part of a, a grave crisis, unreported, 
uh, unreported in most media, uh, in, uh, in a staple of American food. And then, of course, the grain that's fed to cows, much of it is uh, unpalatable. It cannot be eaten by human beings, and yet it's fed to animals who then are fed, or which then are fed to people. American food is no longer nutritious, no matter how tasty it seems. And you have to remember that the good taste of American food that you buy in the store is often there because of monosodium glutamate, MSG, or fructose corn syrup, both of which uh, inhibit the parts of your brain that tell you that you've eaten enough. And so how, how, how can we suggest is the arrival of national economy from local economy? Well, it occurred in the, in the farming sector, and it, uh, it shut down, uh, over time, it shut down local economies, plural. Uh, he, he points out that at the time, it kind of happened just after World War I, where the money economy really took, took strength, and then, of course, the Depression uh, had turned more and more of the economy, in the South anyway, to rely on dollars as opposed to relying on food and production. He says, uh, he says uh, after Roosevelt buried holocausts of shoats and boatloads of oranges, the government warned farmers to get big or get out. University Extension Services promoted a style of farming which required ever greater cash inputs for equipment and chemicals. The more the government helped the farmer, the poorer he became. Thousands of family farms disappeared in the 19 and 60s. Bewildered farmers thought they were making money, but in fact, they were only slowly decapitalizing themselves as industrial farming and imports brought down the prices they received for their products. The more family farmers were driven off the farms, the faster rural populations declined, and the faster local economies dried up. About that time, Walmart showed up. <laughs> And this is the part of the story that we all are familiar with. And Kroger and Lowe's and Home Depot and fast food chains, they hammered the final nails into the local economy's coffin, according to the Money Changer newsletter. Now, virtually 100% of the circulation in the local economy had to be brought in from outside. See, that's what's happening when you have, when you have corporate colonialism earned somewhere else. Local economy, or local money, spent educating youngsters, simply fed the brain and population drain as graduates fled to cities for higher paying jobs. Shifting from local to national economy sprang not only from family farming being replaced by industrial, but also from confounding money and wealth. And that's another thing that we've looked at at newgonomics.com. What's the difference between money and wealth? Across the lands, local chambers of commerce operated, and still do, on the notion that prosperity can only be created by drawing money from outside the county. Like starving South American African farmers in the, 19, in the 1880s, they don't realize that they are standing on acres of diamonds. Lasting prosperity can only be built upon local wealth. Okay, that's why you, my listener, need to start your own little business in keeping with the idea that prosperity can only be had by, by wealth, okay, by having the risk, having the capital, getting it, putting it at risk, creating a new service for some thankful group of people in the marketplace. The simple act of living can supply circulation to rebuild the local economy. And when labor becomes cheaper in China, the jobs won't leave the county. And that's the problem when you have the big, the big out-of-town company build a factory in your town. And that is something that Michael Schumann in his book, Local Dollars, Local Sense, and another book called The Walmart Effect, or The Small Mart Effect, no, I'm sorry, The, Walmart, the Small Mart Economy, uh, that those two books point out that, that uh, these big, uh, big players, such as Volkswagen at Enterprise South, export profit, okay? It's not profitable for us, right? You're, the people who work here are getting just the wages. The profit is distributed to the shareholders worldwide. And uh, he points, uh, Franklin Sanders points out that there used to be 10,000 dairies in Tennessee. Now there are only 500. We import milk from, uh, from far away. I have in my lunch pail, which I'm going to be enjoying after my show today, a glass jar of fruit. 
I got it at the Save-A-Lot, uh, which is run by Super Value, a publicly traded company. And uh, it's made in China, product of China. Why is that? Why am I, why, I, I didn't realize I was buying a jar of, of fruit from China. Uh, why, why do I let myself get away with that? Why am I kicking myself? Well, I'm kicking myself because I need to do better than that. Maybe, maybe you do too. Um, now, local economy is not about organizing people, okay? It's not organized. It's not, it's not saying we need to address, have Congress address the problem. No, <laughs> that's not what we need to do. Um, we have to, we have to, we have to realize that passing laws and all the rest of those things are not are not creating value. Those are kind of feckless and, and uh, what Franklin Sanders calls quixotic activities that make us think that we are accomplishing something while we're really just running in place. This is, these are problems that can't be solved by other people far away. They can be solved tiny step by tiny step by people like you and like me. We need to start patronizing local businesses, local Farmers. We need to shop local, buy local. We need to love our neighbor. There is a Christian argument for it in a totally personal universe, which is part of the Christian theory that everything is personal. Hang on. You can save $2,000 right now on a 2014 Lexus RX 350. This is unheard of. A $2,000 cash rebate on a model 2014 Lexus RX 350. But you have to get the Capital Toyota on Lee Highway. You can save $2,000 right now on a 2014 Lexus RX 350. Capital Toyota is one of the world's classiest mid-price car. The Camry. Capital is your Lexus and Scion deal. And this month you'll save $2,000. Now. That's right. You can save $2,000 right now on a 2014 Lexus RX 350. This is unheard of. A $2,000 cash rebate on a model 2014 Lexus RX 350. Capital Toyota on Lee Highway with a savings route that much better. Are you tired of working in corporate America or have you recently lost your job and would like to consider owning your own business? If you are, please call me as I can help you look at franchises or business opportunities that fit you, the economy that we're in, and the type of businesses that are right in great Chattanooga area. After I help my clients find the right opportunity, I also help them find the best way to finance the business, including paying yourself through the startup phase. If you would like to learn more about opportunities that may be right for you, please call me for a free assessment. My name is Bruce Craig with the Entrepreneur Source. Phone number is 423 87 5621 Associates in Foot and Ankle Care gives every patient that walks through their door, whether it be with ill pain, a sprain, onions, or diabetic complications, the very best medical treatment in a friendly caring environment. From the toddler to the centenarian, Dr. Dennis Bazzacco is able to treat whatever issues affect your foot health. Call 855-0728 for an appointment. That's 855-0728. Dr. Bazzacco and his staff and associates in foot and ankle care in East Ridge would also like to take this time to wish their patients and their families a happy holiday season. Call 855-0728. That's 855-0728 for associates in foot and ankle care in East Ridge. The NASCAR Sprint Cup Series is on the Motor Racing Network. The voice of NASCAR. Copperhead 1240 AM. Southern Rock. Kicking Country. And Tennessee Talk. Ooh, picture that curl of steam rising through your fresh baked pizza. And in a flash, let it take you aloft, teasing all your senses. I'm talking about Jets Pizza. If you eat out of Jets and Hickson, or take home your steaming, deep dish square pizza, you'll love Jets. They use only the best ingredients in a family recipe. Also, try the cheesy bread, wings, chicken, mmm, or bread with bacon, antipasto, or Greek salad. Jets Pizza at Buy Low Nearly S Curves. Open till 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 11 p.m. Friday and Saturday. You can order online or have it delivered. JetsPizza.com. That's JetsPizza.com. Or call it now. We'll have it ready when you get there. 757-1616. That's 757-1616. Hot and delightful above the clouds. Jets Pizza. Mmm. Now that's Italian. 
Hello, guess what? Haven't you heard about the new flight museum in Hickson? The Hickson Flight Museum is one of the most unique places you'll ever visit. We believe in not only preserving history, but giving it life. All exhibits are living, breathing historical artifacts that are regularly maintained and operated. Hickson Flight Museum, offering guided tours, birthday parties, field trips, plane rides, event rentals, and air shows. Located near the Dallas Bay Sky Park, 1824 East Craft Tree Road in Hickson. 423-228-2359, the Hickson Flight Museum. Its curators encourage visitors to climb into the pilot seat of the North American T-28 Trojan, peer into the cockpit of a 1946 Taylor craft, and enjoy a scenic trip over Chattanooga in a 1958 Piper Apache. We're open for individual or group tours, and we welcome school groups, boys and girl scout troops, or any group interested in learning about aviation history. And what we do, please visit our website at hicksonflightmuseum.org. 423-228-2359. Check us out on Facebook. Get the latest news and information now on your Twitter account. Search Hot News Radio. That's Hot News Radio. For the latest news and information, go to Hot News Radio. That's Twitter.com. Then search Hot News Radio. Hot News Radio is a service of Copperhead 1240. Live from Chattanooga, Tennessee, it's Nukonomics with David Toulis. <clears throat> last night before dinner or maybe it was just after dinner I had a lesson to give and it was a reading from a, a book called This Country of Ours a, an old volume written by a noted female author all my children have heard this book or had it read to them in their earlier years and we read the chapter or I read to my son the chapter of the arrival of, of uh, Abraham Lincoln who had sterling character, and, and, and I think my, my son was a, a little unhappy that I twice, I think only twice, interrupted the narrative to make a comment. And, uh, and I, think, I think that somehow Dad's helping the author out <laughs> uh, from a bit of uh, idolization of Abe Lincoln kind of interfered with his apprehension. So as it, as it turns out, his, his, uh, his hearing the story was his repeating it back to me, which is how we do lessons, was just bad. He didn't really narrate the story back to me. He, he couldn't remember the details. It was just a, uh, so I said, this, this, is not, this is not acceptable. You have to pay attention. And when I'm reading, you have to focus on the story and you have to have in your mind the whole of it as it progresses uh, to the bombardment of Fort Sumter. And because, because his listening of it was so poor, I said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna read about Fort Sumter from another source. And I, I turned to, to uh, Mike Scruggs' little book called Uncivil War. It's a, uh, he's a former financial, a former financial advisor and a, a, a friend of the South who has a very eye-opening uh, book. It's a kind of a, kind of a newspaper book that, that we got, I'm not sure where, I think I got it at a League of the South event once when I took the boys to it in South Carolina. And, uh, and the story about, about Fort Sumter is, the, the, normal, the normal story is that, that the South started the war by firing on a boat seeking to provide provisions to federal soldiers in a fort who were starving to death. They were starving and, and uh, that, that, is, that of course is the, the official narrative that, that school children learn. On the other hand, it was really, it was really quite different. And the, 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 the Southern author talks about how it was really, it was, it was, it was a provocation, the, 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 the resupply of Fort Sumter by, I think his name is Colonel Anderson, uh, was a, a provocation. Lincoln uh, and President Davis realized that Lincoln was trying to maneuver uh, maneuver him and maneuver the, the authorities in Charleston in South Carolina to fire the first shot. And, and, and Davis knew, Davis understood why that, that you know, he understood what that was about. Uh, and he, but he still played into Lincoln's hand. Uh, Scruggs says, Davis knew that legally the aggressor in war and other law is not the first to use force, but the first to, the first to render force necessary. But you see, that's kind of a legal nicety. And the narrative thus, thusly belongs to 
uh, to the Yankees and the South started the war and uh, and, and but, but after the story goes on to, to talk about how how uh, President Davis shouldered the responsibility for the, the engagement in a statement to his cabinet. He said, the order for the sending of the fleet was a declaration of war. The responsibility is on their shoulders, not on ours. The juggle for position as to who shall fire the first shot in such an hour is unworthy of a great people and their cause. A deadly weapon has been aimed at our heart. And I think this is a famous image from Jefferson Davis. A deadly weapon has been aimed at our heart. Only a fool would wait until the first shot has been fired. The assault has been made. It is of no importance who shall strike the first blow or fire the first gun. And there were, when Lincoln called up troops, there were uh, governors of many states who refused to comply. Uh, and <laughs> Governor Jackson, Missouri, had a harsh reply to Lincoln. He said, your acquisition is illegal, unconstitutional, revolutionary, inhuman, diabolical, and cannot be complied with. And the, the governor of Kentucky, McGoffin, said, I say emphatically, Kentucky will furnish no troops for the wicked purpose of subduing her sister southern states. And of course, the, the war went on. What I, what I really appreciate is, I, I should have perhaps talked about this yesterday, life, uh, life is, is among the slaves and the, the great beneficence that Christianity brought to the black race. Blacks who were enslaved did not want to go back to Africa, even though a few days before his assassination, President Lincoln was uh, had further discussions, I think, with uh, his Secretary Seward about sending the, the project to send to send slaves, former slaves, back to uh, the uh, to the dark continent. And of course, that would have served none of them well. Though I think many of them did go back to Liberia where uh, there was a kind of an American colony. But uh, anyway, that, that has passed. We'll have to talk about that another time. The thing I wanted to, to look at, well, getting your son to recite back, that's, that's, how, we, that's how we do lessons. And so uh, the boy who's 11 uh, has, uh, has still failed me in not reciting back. So you see, I have, I have responsibility for his understanding of things. And I want him to have a, a true perspective, to be a Southern Gentlemen, of course, the South had many faults to understand what those were. For example, the draft. The draft was a, a pernicious evil. So was depreciating currency, both of which were, uh, which were used to fund the war on credit in notes that would not be paid back, stiffing the creditors. But uh, these, are, these are huge faults that were universal at that time, I, and I don't... Uh, they're wrong, and, uh, and one can't uh, one can't really forgive them. But one should understand that they were uh, they were there. But on the other hand, the idea of the South, which had a a strongly Christian orientation, uh, is extremely important to to understand, and to understand also that the war was fought not for slave not over slavery. That was a a gloss that that came much later. Uh, as, as, and in and, and, and Lincoln's thinking, it was a way of def defending his cause to the world at large. Though Yankee troops weren't, weren't there fighting for black people. They would not have tokened to that at all. Uh, I, I remember reading a quote from Grant saying that if, if the war had been fought over the black people and their liberation, no one would have joined uh, the army, even, even had they been induced uh, by, by money to do so. Well, we've been talking about we're talking about the rise of industrial farming and how that's uh, how that's had a, a very deleterious effect, very evil effect on on local economy. It has uh, it has gutted local economy, and uh, I point out that, that economies of scale in agriculture also create wastes of scale as well. And um, we had uh, Will Potter earlier this week come to Chattanooga to talk about how the the industrial farming system is so is so terribly cruel that, and, and the, the owners of it are uh, giant corporations are so belligerent uh, against journalists that they're they've passed laws to make it a trying to make it a crime to report the uh, terrible conditions of uh, animals in the factory farm system, the factory farm system that is part of our uh, part of our national crisis, is part of our obesity crisis. 
part of our uh, our, our ill health as a as a people. Uh, you know, CAFOs are the, the animal feeding operations. Well, the the uh, the crisis came partly in, 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 in the shift from a subsistence economy in the South to a money economy, and that came with the, with the tractor. The farmer no longer uh, able to supply his own power. He had to buy, he had to send money out of the local economy for gasoline, for parts, for tractors, for uh, implements that go on the tractor. And so, uh, and so the attention of farm families shifted slowly toward money, and people are not satisfied with the farm life anymore. Uh, the women folk, they want to go to town, the sons want to go to the city, and rural life, uh, time with family, these are all broken up by the arrival of, of money. And you say, well, what's bad with that? Well, money, money economies inevitably, according to the Money Changer newsletter, the money economy inevitably lead toward the uh, ownership of everything by the creditor. The creditor is the one who issues the money, right? The people who, are, or who's, who have control of the minting of it or the circulation of the paper notes. They inevitably come to own all of it and, and in theory could own every last nut, every last bolt, every last square uh, foot of ground or every last acre. And we have, uh, we have in our country that very prospect where everyone is hugely in debt. Uh, wealth passes to creditors, and he, he writes about how in, you know, in ancient times your, your, your value was in your, your goats, your, your cattle, your slaves, your vineyards, your boats, your mines, mills, and things like that. All of those, all of those are capable of producing something uh, useful. They're fertile. Uh, and money, though, is not fertile. Money by itself is not fertile like land is. And, that, and th I think that's true even if the money is coined, like silver coins, if it's coined in fraudulent form as what we have today, paper, paper money, fiat money, uh, or even digital. Those, 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 uh, the fact that money is digital doesn't make the problem go away. And th the problem then that we have in, in national economy is financialization, where everything is in terms of money. Nothing is in terms of production. Certainly nothing is in terms of character. Right? And you, my listener, know that character is essential for prosperity in local economy. Your character matters everything. You're keeping your word. Uh, you're honoring your contracts. You're being fair in your weights and your measures. You're looking out for your customer. And you're looking out even for your competitors, right? You're not just, you're not at war with other providers of your service. You are, you know, you're colleagues. You are working together to serve a large group of people who are your customers. And, and, and so if, if you don't have restraints on, uh, on money, if you don't have restraints on debt and usury, well, the, the lender ends up owning everything. He'll, everything will pass to him. All the wealth, all the land will pass to him, and that's not for that doesn't make for harmony. That 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 leads to harm. That leads to centralization. Uh, civil order is hard to arrive at, and and so that's what happens when a country and its wealth shifts from from property and wealth to money. That changes the character of people. Uh, they become well, they they become more self-centered. They become more consumer-oriented. He says, uh, more in that production he will take care of not to, okay, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, since money is an abstract, it is, uh, it is abstracted too abstract. Certainly, you can get money by production, but the far faster way is to traffic in money itself. Okay, this is, this is our great problem, and this is what uh, is responsible in part for the 2008 meltdown. Uh, lending, handling, and investing Stock markets and corporations entered, separating money getting from neighbors, neighborhoods, people, production, and most of all, personal liability and responsibility. See, that, the old economy had those things. And with stock markets and, and corporations, those things are separating money from character and locale. It became possible to invent, invest in production without knowing or caring about the long-term costs and consequences. The morality of business was reduced to the following. What is the number at the bottom line? Environmental and social costs in California and Michigan couldn't really matter to an investor in New York or Florida 
unless they hit the bottom line. The results of this mindset on the American character are too obvious to need comment. Americans' goal became piling up money rather than wealth. That's expressed in the bumper sticker, he who dies with the most toys wins. Everybody became an investor, but most became speculators. Okay, that's what people who call themselves investors are often not that. They're just gamblers. They're just speculators aiming at joining the retired rentier class. Rentier class are, are sort of profit seekers, advantage takers. The phrase former day trader, he says, eloquently sums up the speculator's end. What happened, another shift that he mentions is the shift from household economy to, to industrial economy for, for the first 6,000 years of human society. Most, most economic activity took place around the house, right, the home, not the family or the corporation. For all its limitations, the household economy brings capital and labor side by side. Because of the closeness of its members, it must be ruled by love, the biblical fulfillment of the law the golden rule rather than greed. So you see, that's why I have the expectation that in local economy there's much more affection, there's much more patience. Patient capital is possible in local economy, but it's not possible in national economy. Patient capital being the idea that you invest $10,000 in that neighbor's bike shop, but knowing that you'll be paid back your investment later, you are patiently waiting for it. You don't have to have it back in a quarter's time. The, the owner-worker relation is not solely economic, so it is not ruled by getting the most work for the lowest wage. You see that? Local economy will favor wages. A household economy, and, and Reverend Merritt, who protested uh, the, the federal minimum wage statute before the McDonald's on Brainerd Road, maybe is barking up a wrong tree. A household economy locates capital in households dispersed widely through the economy rather than concentrating it. That means the greatest possible number of people have their own stake in the economy's success. In a household economy, children are useful, <laughs> adding to the family's output rather than hanging on as 18-year-old productive drains. You quickly see that today among the Amish, every child has some work all his own. The Amish even teach two-year-olds to fill the wood box. Of course, how a strictly household economy has limitation. Lower production, little standardization, insufficient capital to undertake large products. The deleterious shift I am describing is more dramatically shown. When enterprises change from family to corporate ownership, by now very few family-owned firms are left. One I know was sold a few years ago and the new corporate owners came in, fired about a fourth of the staff, and raised a production quota to ridiculous levels. Sure, the family owners had probably tolerated a bigger staff than, than was needed, but those people were part of the family. I worked at the Chattanooga News Free Press years ago when I was hired by Lee Anderson, and Mr. Roy still had his office there with his uh, white shirt that was yellow under the armpits because he was a farmer. He was a farmer, grocer, publisher. And uh, it was an overstaffed newspaper, it was not efficient, but it, it was filled with people who were his friends, right? They were his friends, people who helped him out, people he trusted, they had their own thieves, these people. When uh, the News Free Press was bought by Waco Media, which then in turn bought the, the Chattanooga Times, you had much more economizing, very rational operation, a kind of a national perspective. Everything was made very efficient. People could not keep their thieves anymore. And of course, that's when the, the delivery crisis occurred, when, when the, uh, the new owners uh, stripped people who had built up for two generations routes around Chattanooga. They were broken up, and uh, they, were, they had become their own independent businesses, very profitable, uh, very large routes owned, run by families. They were all shot down and divided up in, uh, in a very kind of brutal fashion. Brutal for the reader who didn't get his paper, Brutal for those families who lost everything. Changing from household to industrial model necessarily changes relationship between owner and worker. Legally, the master-servant relationship has become employer and employee, the user and the usee, greed and the bottom line, not mercy or love, 
through this relationship. And uh, I'll write about that, and uh, Franklin Sanders write about, writes about that at our website, which is nuganomics.com. We cover local economy and free love. Uh, what do I say? Well, local economy and the free market. I was free love. I'm, I'm reading here a headline on, a, on a, a, another thing I wanted to mention, if I, if I have time, about how local economy and fam the family economy, the home-based economy, really has love in it. And, and Franklin Sanders, in a very fine piece of writing, says, uh, how do we combat the effects of greed? And he says, the remedy lies in the law of God. Obedience to that law defines love. The Ten Commandments are divided into the first table, and the first four commandments defining our duty to God. And the second table, the last six, that define our duty to our fellow man. Christ summed up these duties when asked what was the greatest commandment, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That is the, the ground of local economy. It really can't be the ground of national economy. Why? Because corporations rule. And corporations are man-made creatures and it is hard for them being purely rational entities to have a care for God and his laws and his claims upon the soul of everyone because corporations don't have souls. I'm not saying that a corporation is evil. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have corporations, but uh, corporations are purely profit-driven and rationally oriented. They don't have souls and they don't think in terms of people. Uh, too often, he says, we remember only half of the law, the forbidding, but every law that forbids an evil also commands a good. If we have only refrained from hurting our neighbor, we haven't fulfilled the law. Rather, we must also positively try to do him good. And that is, that is the argument of local economy. The Eighth Commandment, for example, commands us not to steal, but at the same time also commands us to promote our neighbor's wealth and well-being. Through public education, industrial capitalism, not free markets or free enterprise, has turned a nation of freeholders into a nation of employees. To reverse our present economic serfdom, then, we must reverse what modernism has done. We have to turn employees into freeholders. And we talk about the Chamber of Commerce not really doing that, right? The Chamber of Commerce is interested in drawing big business into Chattanooga and Hamlin County, forgetting that its real job as I would propose it, is to help small guys like you, small guys like me, become profitable, to become freeholders. Uh, not, not to have centralized employment through giant corporations such as Volkswagen. That's not, that's not, that's not freedom, okay? That's not, that's not having a freehold. If you have centralized government, you're going to have centralized corporations. What we want is decentralized government and a decentralized economy. And that's much more possible with the advent of Al Gore's invention, the internet. Uh, we, we need to build up local economy not from the outside in, but from the inside out, from the inside out, not outside in. Okay, we can't, we can't have a little fertilizer, which is corporate economy brought here. That's kind of, that's kind of uh, you know, the sulfur of, of, of um, the artificial stimulus for your garden or your little plot of land. Uh, don't have an artificial stimulus, have a real stimulus. Let there grow organic, let there grow microbes in the soil. The food is more healthy that comes from your garden, and you have fewer chemicals. It needs to come from the inside out. That's, that's, uh, and that's why I think the, the summation of local economy is love your neighbor by local. And, and remembering as you, as you think that today and tomorrow, that uh, small is better than big, personal is better than corporate, and local is better than remote. I think if we think in terms of that, even people who disagree with us on all kinds of things, uh, even people who you would never get along with in politics, would agree that local economy is a good theory to promote uh, good things, to promote the betterment of common people, to help the poor, uh, to use capital in a wiser fashion. That happens in local economy. And, 
And I, I really suggest you think with me through these things. Our show is newgnomics.com. My name is David Tulis. David Tulis. And uh, we're here every day from 1 to 3 at the Copperhead Station, the little station that could remember Panera Posse is every Friday in Hickson at 6.45 a.m. where we round up the bad guys and put the money back in the bank. Sad. On a 2014 Lexus RX 350. This is unheard of.